Oh yeah, here we go. Got it. Okay. So today I wanted to talk to you about two things, old and new aspects of our environment, and then how we as humans internalize our environment. And so the ancient aspects of our environment that my lab considers are um, all based in geophysical cycles. So these include the day-night cycle, the glacial cycles, the seasons, the tides, and the lunar cycles. And so I say that these are ancient aspects of our environment because they really are based on geophysical properties of our planet and our solar system. And so if we organize those cycles along um, a kind of timeline for very short period cycles, we have the tidal cycles, um, which are approximately um, twice a day. And then we have the dial cycles, which are 24 hours, our lunar cycles, Oh, oh, sorry, um, which are um, approximately 28 days, our annual cycles, which are the 365, and then our interglacials, which are um, tens and thousands of years. And so these cycles are determined by um, the Earth spinning about its axis, the Earth orbiting the sun, the moon or orbiting the Earth. And so even though we've had changes in the length of these cycles, such as the length of day, since the um, beginning of our solar system, in terms of the last 300,000 years since we've been a species, these cycles have um, remained fairly, pretty much constant. But um, one of the things is that we have alterations to the how we as organisms on this planet experience these cycles because of um, human behavior. And so in terms of each of these cycles, we have either climate change or artificial light that has impacted them. So for instance, um, with our tidal cycles, we have sea level rises. And so um, the um, high tides are much more extreme. So um, king tides are much more extreme because of the changes in um, sea level. And then when we look at the um, light cycles, the 24 hour light cycle, and then also the lunar cycle, our experience of those cycles, as well as experience of other animals is um, now been perturbed due to, due to artificial light and specifically um, light at night. And we'll talk a little bit later about light during the day. And then when it comes to um, our glacial interglacials and our annual cycles, can really think of um, climate change as having shaken up our seasons. So in many temperate regions around the world, um, spring is coming earlier. And so these cycles, how they um, kind of manifested historically are quite different today. And so, as I mentioned before, um, climate change has had this effect of shaking up the seasons. And I wanted to give you two examples of how, um, because of this, that generates mismatches between organisms and their environment. So here on top, I'm showing um, a ring seal pup in the Alaskan Arctic. This was actually a species that I used to work on um, when I was an undergraduate. And um, ring seals have very distinct breeding phenology um, where mothers will actually give birth to their pups underneath the snow. So on top of the ice, they will use their claws and they'll dig these snow layers under the snow. And then that's where they'll give birth to their pups. And because these snow layers um, are very insulated, then that means that females can then nurse their pups in those layers and they will stay warm until they put on enough fat to be able to leave the layer. But now with early your snow melts um, in the spring in the Arctic, now there's a mismatch of this timing of reproduction and um, the availability of snow. So here you have a pup that is going to freeze to death because they don't have that snow to insulate them. And that reproductive timing is um, fairly hard coded in these animals in terms of their seasonal reproductive biology. And now we have another example that's also quite stark. Um, and this is a hair. And for this hair, it undergoes a molt annually where it changes its coat color from brown to white and then back from white to brown. And usually this is, uh, well, this is done based on the length of the day. So um, these hairs have a biological um, clock that is seasonally timed 
to entrain to the day link to tell them when to switch their coat color. But now the timing of the snow melts and the um, changes in the day length no longer coincide in the same way that they did historically. So what's happened with this hair is its body has paid attention to the length of day and it has not gotten rid of its um, white coat, but there's no snow. And so now it's mismatched to its environment and can get picked off by a predator. And so these are two examples of how organisms have shaped their seasonal biology to how our seasons were historically, but now in the Anthropocene with all with human driven climate change, we have this mismatch. And one of the things that I would like you to think about throughout this talk is how are we as humans also mismatched to our environment. And um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the other things that my lab um, considers is the effect of artificial light um, on human health. And so here, this is um, an image, a satellite image from NASA showing light at night in the United States. And um, you can actually look up this these light at night maps for any part of the world. And the light at night, even though us as humans, we're using this to be able to see and do activities at night, um, such as working, um, spending time with family, reading, et cetera, this is having a detrimental effect, um, potentially not only on us, but on other organisms. And so right now, um, there is a worldwide um, firefly and glowworm extinction going on due to artificial light at night and pesticide use. And then um, lastly, as I had mentioned earlier, that um, because of climate change, now we have um, mismatches between biology and the current environment, but we also in cities have mismatches between human built infrastructure and the environment. So this here um, is an example um, from California where they're showing that during a full moon and a king tide, now they're having um, flooding because their infrastructure was not built for the current um, sea level. And so, <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that um, my lab works on is, well, how do we internalize our environment and how does this impact our health? So I gave you some examples of organisms with the seal and the hair of how they um, time their biology to the environment, but how do humans do this? And first, in order to talk about that, I need to talk a little bit about biological rhythms and explain what biological rhythms are. And you may have gotten a little bit of this um, already from other talks, so I apologize if this is redundant. Um, but biological rhythms are the ways in which organisms anticipate and prepare for predictable changes in their environment. And my favorite example of um, a biological rhythm is a circadian rhythm of sunflowers and how sunflowers orient themselves throughout the day. And the thing that I want you to um, take note of is the evolutionary advantage or importance of biological rhythms is that they allow for anticipation and preparation for predictable environmental changes. And it's that anticipation and preparation that gives organisms the upper hand if they have rhythms, which pretty much all organisms do. Anyhow, so with the sunflowers, how this works is you get these lovely pictures of sunflowers because they all have their back to the sun. So on the back of a sunflower is this big photosynthetic organ. It's this big green patch. So in order to maximize photosynthesis, they need to keep that photosynthetic patch facing the sun. And so in the day, as the sun is moving across the sky, this is quite easy to do. They can reorient themselves to keep their back to the sun, but the anticipation and preparation component of this comes once the sun is down. So at night, so the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. So um, at night, what happens is the sunflowers need to reorient themselves to prepare for sunrise the next morning and be and be ready for it. And it's their circadian clock that allows them to do that preparation. And so organisms do this type of anticipation and preparation 
for across geophysical cycles. So um, there are circadian rhythms, which are the 24 hour rhythms, there are circalunar rhythms, which are really common in um, marine organisms. And then there's circ annual rhythms, which are the annual seasonal rhythms, as I had described with that hair that changes its coat color. And what got me interested in whether or not these biological rhythms have an impact on human health was that I did my PhD on epidemic prone diseases. So I had studied one disease in particular, um, polio virus, which is a summertime infectious disease that would sweep across the United States every summer. And for decades, essentially now it's been close to 100 years, um, epidemiologists have tried to figure out why this disease occurs in the summer. And there are other infectious diseases um, that are very well known to be wintertime diseases. So in 2018, I set out to ask the question, well, are which infectious diseases are seasonal and what are the known seasonal drivers of infectious diseases? And what I ended up finding in looking across all 69 human diseases, and now we have um, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, so we would have to add that to this list. But at that time we had 69 known human infections. What I found was that there is documented seasonality for every single infection. And the timing of the outbreaks depended on the particular infection and also where in the world it was occurring. And so there were some infectious disease that, diseases that were summertime diseases, some infections that were wintertime diseases, spring, fall, etc. And then in the tropics, there are diseases that are structured by rainy season versus dry season. And one of the things that was really fascinating about this was that there were, uh, there's evidence that even for chronic infections, those that last for life, that there is also seasonality. So for instance, there's seasonality in herpes virus in terms of the actual reactivation of the virus. Um, there's seasonality um, for HIV in places, this is kind of predating um, antiretrovirals, where even though an individual may be um, already infected with HIV, they actually um, transition to AIDS was seasonal and was actually tied to seasonal malnutrition. And so um, what this led me to realize was that um, there were many different aspects external to the human body that had been considered in terms of the drivers for disease seasonality, but there hadn't been uh, much investigation in terms of things that are internal to the human body. So for instance, um, children contacting each other in school is the primary driver for measles and chicken pox. We have um, vector-borne diseases such as dengue and Zika, where it's the seasonality of the mosquito that's actually driving the seasonality. And then we have lots of infections like RSV and influenza, where it's the seasonal climate but what I wanted to know is whether or not there were any changes internal to the human body and potentially um, any biological rhythms that could drive the um, seasonality for infectious diseases. And what also got me um, to become very interested in this question is that at the same time, I had been working on the seasonality of um, births in humans, so seasonal reproduction in humans which we now know is some combination of seasonal changes in sexual activity, but also seasonal fertility. So here I'm showing um, data in the bottom right um, of monthly births in the state of New York from 1930 until 2014. And I love this time series because um, it shows, it gives an example of seasonal biology in humans that's kind of right under our noses, but um, we don't think about very often. So here, what you can see are these big giant secular changes in um, the number of births. And for instance, this spike here is um, the World War II baby boom. So right after 
the soldiers returned back to the United States. But then what you see running along this time series are all these little um, spikes. So we have a spike and then a trough and a spike and a trough. And what that is, is the seasonal birth pulse that is happening very consistently um, during this time period and continues today. And we can actually look at birth data from any country in the world and you will see um, the seasonal birth pulse. And so, in addition to that, we also see in the United States seasonality in terms of the um, mortality for non-infectious diseases. So um, these time series here in the middle are showing the seasonality for heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, um, and COPD. And so all of this taken together tells us, well, there's a time of year when people are more likely to be born, there are times of year when people are more likely um, to die, and also what we know from um, the work on infectious diseases, there are times of year when we're more likely to get particular infections. So taken together, this um, is highly suggestive that our health and disease is seasonally structured. And so um, what I did was back in, I guess we started in 2016 with planning, um, but from 2018 to 2019, I assembled an international team of researchers to ask the question of whether or not humans have um, seasonal biology in terms of our physiology. <clears throat> And this included um, Deborah Skeen, who Anna had mentioned um, recently, who, or earlier when she was introducing me. Um, and Deborah is my um, close colleague and collaborator um, on this study. And we used her facilities um, at the University of Surrey to, to conduct this work. And so this um, project, we finished up sampling in 2019, right um, before the pandemic hit, in December, winter solstice 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And and we're still in the um, data analysis phase right now. And so just to share a little bit um, with you what we did. So we wanted to look at seasonal biology in humans, um, but in order to do this, we also needed to control for circadian rhythms and look at circadian rhythms. So at the University of Surrey, they have this great chronobiology facility with six individual sleep rooms. And these are sound attenuated rooms where we can very carefully control the um, lighting conditions and also meals and such. But most importantly, um, these rooms have through the portal um, blood sampling. And what that means is that when a participant is in the room, they can be um, cannulated. So they can have a cannula in their arm and this can run um, out uh, into the hallway, essentially in a hole through the hall wall. And our nurses on the outside of the sleep room can draw blood without disturbing the participant, which means that we can actually get blood samples from people when they're active and also when they're asleep um, without disturbing them. And that allows us to get a look into what's happening in the human body, um, both during the night and during the day. So um, what we did is we um, were both looking at seasonality and circadian rhythms. So we brought people in each season of the year. So we brought them in around um, winter solstice 2018, the spring equinox, um, sorry, yeah, spring equinox 2019, summer solstice uh, 2019, the autumn equinox 2019, and then winter solstice 2019. And each season that each participant was in, they stayed in for three days straight. And during each of those three days, we took blood samples from them every single hour. Um, so this was incredibly high resolution um, sampling. We also took urine samples, fecal samples, and nasal swabs from them. So from our 18 participants, we collected um, over, well, almost 10,000 samples. I'm going to skip through that. And so what we really wanted to know is we wanted to get a holistic picture of um, biological rhythms. And so uh, we were looking at light exposure that uh, our participants were experiencing at home before they came into the lab. So we wanted to know how much light they're getting each season of the year. We looked at um, neuroendocrine hormones that are known to be 
pretty much direct outputs of the circadian clock, so melatonin and cortisol. But then we're really interested, especially in my lab, in um, peripheral clocks. Um, and what I mean by um, peripheral clocks are circadian clocks throughout body systems that are not necessarily um, neuroendocrine driven. So this includes um, the immune system, our metabolism, um, gene expression in cells of the immune system, and then also sex hormones. And we looked at things like mood and cognition and sleep as well. And so I just wanted to give you a feel for um, what we saw in our participants. And as I was saying, this is still um, in the data. We're still in the data analysis phase. So this is by no means complete, but I want to give you a sense of what's, what's happening. So here is an example of a nighttime hormone, melatonin. So melatonin is um, produced at night and is really a measure um, of our nighttime physiology. So think of melatonin as kicking our bodies into nighttime mode. So here we have for one season of the year, this was summer 2019, the uh, melatonin profiles for each of our participants. And so each colored line is a different person. And so what I want you to notice is that across these three days that our participants were in in the summer, you have these big spikes at night and then melatonin um, declines during the day. And then the next night, a big spike and then melatonin declines. Then the next night, a big spike and melatonin declines. And importantly, this very first day that our participants were in the lab, we kept them in a completely constant condition. So they were in um, very dim light. They were just sitting in their beds, pretty much perfectly still in a position like this. Um, they uh, were having fixed meal times. And so what we're seeing here in terms of their melatonin pro profile is what's happening um, endogenously in their body. So it's not just a response to us turning the lights off and then them producing melatonin or turning the lights on and their body not producing melatonin. They're in complete dim light. So what we're actually showing here um, is a true biological rhythm. This is a true change in this hormone um, production that is coming even under perfectly constant conditions. Were there any questions? Wanted to give an opportunity if there, nope, okay. And because I only have 15 minutes left, I wanted to run through a couple more of these. Um, so for morning time hormones, we actually measured um, cortisol, which is a little bit more complicated than melatonin. But for example, here um, in, during the winter, we could see that this cortisol peak was occurring in our participants around 7 a.m. So melatonin and cortisol essentially have this um, dual functionality of, um, or I should say like trade-off functions of melatonin being the signal of night to our body and then cortisol being the signal of day. And if we put our melatonin and cortisol data in a 24 hour ring, what we can see in blue, this is the, in dark blue, this is the time um, of day where we have high melatonin production. So we see that around 1 a.m. until about um, six in the morning is when we had the very high melatonin production. And then um, for cortisol, cortisol starts um, kicking off around 7 a.m. and stays um, fairly high in, until about noon. And so we have that switch off between um, nighttime and daytime hormones. But like I said, um, my lab was also really interested in what's happening in the immune system. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides pretty quickly, but um, I wanted to show you data from our B cells. So B cells, as I'm showing in this little cartoon up here, are um, cells that produce antibodies. So when we have a new infection um, that we're exposed to, it's the B cells that then go and make antibodies specific to that virus or that pathogen that has infected us. And if we count the number of um, B cells that are in the blood, what we end up seeing is that they traffic around the body. There are certain times when um, we have high concentrations of B cells in the blood. So that's when these um, peaks are at night. 
And then um, we have times when there are fewer B cells in the blood. And what's happening is that these cells are actually moving in between our blood and other organs in our bodies, including our lymph nodes. So that they're like little cars on a highway um, that are moving based on um, the time of day. And we can look across cells of the immune system and here on the top, I'm showing examples of three different um, cells of our adaptive immune system. So this is the part of our immune system that uh, undergoes specific attacks of um, pathogens. And we have these three important cell types, the B cells, CD8 T cells, and CD4 T cells um, that are all elevated in our blood at night. And um, the last thing I wanted to show in terms of the immune system is we actually isolated cells, not only um, throughout the day and the night, but also between the winter and the summer. And then we challenge these cells to different um, antigens. So these are little components of pathogens. And then we look to see um, what the chemical response or the cytokine response of um, these various cells were. And so just to give you an example of one of these um, uh, stimulation studies, uh, what we did was we took a group of cells from the immune system and then um, from both winter and summer and then exposed them to a bacterial antigen and a fungal antigen. And we measured a bunch of different cytokines. Um, here's data from one cytokine, which is called IL-6. And this is really important mediator of fever. And what we ended up finding is that in winter, which is shown here in um, turquoise, that the cells, um, wintertime cells, were um, producing this fever inducing cytokine at a significantly higher level um, than cells that are isolated in the summer. And I'm going to skip through this, but all I'm going to say is that uh, when we look at sex hormones, um, testosterone is a morning time hormone. So it peaks in the morning in men. And we actually see seasonal differences of when that testosterone um, peak occurs. And so all of this um, taken together is suggesting that our hormones and our immune system are not only organized by the day night cycle, but potentially also organized seasonally. But one big question that that then um, leads us to ask is, well, if our bodies do have the potential to be organized by the seasons, does that really manifest in us? Because how much do humans living in modern society really experience the seasonal changes in our environment in terms of seasonal changes in light and seasonal changes um, in temperature and humidity, et cetera, because we live in this highly artificial um, built environment. And so my lab conducted this study um, in New York City looking, and this was a complementary study, um, but looking at um, light exposure throughout the seasons and throughout the day night cycle. And the picture that I want you to um, take with you today is really how is it that we live our lives? Are we um, more to the pictures on the left where we have extreme amounts of artificial light during the day and then at night um, using light at night? Or we are, are we living our day-to-day -day lives more like the pictures on the right where we actually are getting exposure to natural light and experiencing night and experiencing seasonal changes in our environment? And so what we did was we outfitted um, a group of participants, 24 participants with a light sensor and a body temperature sensor, um, with a light sensor being on a lanyard on the neck. And we had them wear this um, for two, let's see, was it two weeks straight? No, it was one week straight every season of the year um, for a year. And um, then what, and what we also did is we put light sensors outside in New York City as well, because our participants were living in New York City and, New and also in New Jersey. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to compare the amount of light um, that is occurring outside in, in an environment that includes both light pollution 
and natural light cycles and compare that to what people are experiencing. So on the left here, I'm gonna show you um, the outdoor light and here we have outdoor light in the summer. So this ring is 20, showing 24 hours and the um, red areas are showing that there was detectable um, light intensity and the darker red is showing um, a high lux or so high light intensity. And then the gray areas is essentially when there was um, less than 10 lux of um, light. And so this is like very dim light that our sensors couldn't detect. And so you could see here in the summer that the sun was rising before 6 a.m. So we get that detectable light. And then the sun um, was going down was probably about I don't know, eight or 9 p.m. or even later here. And then if we look at the other seasons, we can see, even though this is in uh, Manhattan and New York, we can see very strong seasonal differences in um, the length of day. And so here we can see that this red area is shorter for fall, even shorter for winter, and then um, the days start to lengthen again in the spring. And this is even in an extremely urban environment. But if we compare that to the light exposure for our um, study participants during these exact same weeks um, and the exact same year, we see some very stark differences. And um, there are three things that I wanna point out here to you. So if we look at the light exposure on the study participants, it's much lighter. So the coloring itself is much lighter, which is showing that they're getting uh, much lower intensity light than natural light. Um, the other thing that I want you to notice is um, after sunset, so these areas that are gray on the left side where we're not detecting light outdoors, you still see light bleeding over into those um, areas when we look at the participants. And this is showing is that people are getting a lot of um, light at night, so artificial light. And then the other thing that I want you to notice is if we compare these rings, we're not seeing stark differences across the seasons like we do in the outdoor light. And so um, people in general are dimming out their days, they're lighting up their nights and washing away the seasonal changes in light by our behavior. And that's um, what I had on that slide. And um, one of the other things that our study wasn't able to um, capture, but I think is really important to know is that other research groups have shown that it's not just about light intensity that matters, but also the color of the light that we experience. And the color of light that we experience changes um, throughout the day for natural light, changes throughout the day as the sun um, moves across the horizon. So when you hear about full spectrum sunlight, so here is a color spectrum, for sunlight at noon, it has all of the different um, color components to it. And then as the sun is moving across the horizon, the spectrum um, will change. But it's really important to note that the full spectrum sunlight is really different than the color of light that we experience from artificial light. So even though the human eye can't detect um, the light spectrum, the actual composition of red, green, blue, yellow, et cetera, um, there can be underlying differences that are have impacts for our body clock. So here is again the spectrum of sunlight and then also showing that um, against uh, the spectrum of a daylight fluorescent lamp. And what you can see in this daylight fluorescent lamp, it's not as full, it's much more spiky. And there are some areas where there are these troughs where certain colors just aren't represented. So when we're indoors and we're getting this dimmed out artificial light, we're also getting light that is highly depoperate um, in terms of the color spectrum composition. And so um, in order to put this in a little bit broader perspective in terms of, well, what does this mean for our health? Um, what should we be doing in terms, oh, sorry, my computer's falling, in terms of um, light exposure or getting outside? Um, when I look at these data, I the way that I interpret them in terms of how they can inform um, human health is that, well, we need to have more exposure to natural light um, if we're gonna keep our body clocks entrained. And still we don't know um, 
the full picture of what's happening with the with the human body seasonally, um, but um, actually experiencing these seasonal changes in light could be beneficial if these um, seasonal rhythms in our body actually have like true health importance. Um, but I would like to say that we have many benefits of going outside and it doesn't just have to do with light, even though exposure to natural light can be important for our body clocks. But we also have the benefits of when we go outside, outside um, getting the exercise that's often associated with going outside, whether that be to take public transportation or to cycle to work or walking your dog, whatever it might be. Um, we know that exercise is good for our health. And there are more and more studies showing that mental health and well-being is actually improved by going outside. And there was a study um, that just uh, came out in the last couple of weeks has been in the news quite a bit, um, looking at the benefits of um, bird song in, and hearing bird song improving mental health. So these opportunities for experiencing nature can improve our well-being. And of course, when we spend time outside, um, we have opportunities to um, connect with our, our community. And um, lastly, because I want to leave a couple minutes for questions, um, I wanted to bring up kind of a opportunity that we have right now on the horizon for increasing um, people's access um, to spending time outside. So right now throughout the world, there's a lot of investment in um, climate change and mitigation and adaptation. So what this means is changing up our cities so that we're mitigating climate change, meaning that we are either starting to sequester CO2 or not putting as much CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, but also um, adapting for the new environment under climate change. And this includes things like um, building green buffers um, to protect cities from flooding and um, building green spaces that can actually um, reduce heat traps in cities, et cetera. Um, but all of these climate adaptation and mitigation strategies, when they are increasing green space and blue space access, can also um, have this co-benefit of getting us outside. And so here is a, an image of um, a mock-up for a plan in the South Bronx, which is a highly industrial area in New York City um, that's very prone to flooding, where they're removing industrial sites and then um, replacing them with green spaces um, that can buffer from storms. And so we do have this massive infrastructure investment now going on around the world that can have this co-benefit of not only helping with the climate crisis, but can get us outdoors. And so with that, I think I have a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure I give time for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mikaela. That was really interesting. Also, thanks for sharing the new data. Um, while I'm waiting for people to put questions in the chat, uh, maybe I can start with one. Mm -hmm. um, so you haven't shown this, but you apparently tested for, like, for cognition and stuff as well, so um, cognitive variables. So do you have already any uh, information on that? I your, don't because, uh, you know, we have yeah. not digitized our cognitive tests yet because we were having them do like paper tests. And so we are still in the process of, of analyzing all of those data. Well, digitizing them to analyze those data. So I'm sorry, sorry I don't have I a more satisfactory it. answer, but maybe by the end of the year, I'm essentially spending the ne next nine months just doing data analysis. Okay, um, then we have a question by David. I think, David, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope you can hear me. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask uh, throughout your uh, study, throughout your experiment, I would say, um, do you have some kind of hypothesis why um, we, I would say, tend to be in some seasons more affected by some kind of diseases or affected by our sexual behavior or, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So 
when thinking about potential seasonal changes in human physiology, um, it helps to take from what we know from circadian biology, which is that when we look at biological rhythms in general, and particularly circadian rhythms, that it's a um, kind of reorganization of physiology that happens around the clock. And it's when one thing that we've learned specifically looking for at, at circadian rhythms in the immune system is it's not that your immune system is stronger at one point and weaker at another, making you um, more or less vulnerable to everything at a, a particular time, but it's a restructuring in terms of your immune response. And so, for instance, um, your immune system can be in a more pro-inflammatory state at certain times of day. So therefore, if you have um, an exposure where the pathology, the actual sickness is from inflammation, then it can be that one window of time where you're pro-inflammatory that you might be uh, more vulnerable to inflammatory diseases. But then you could have some other disease where you may be more sensitive at a different time of day, depending on how that disease manifests. And so um, it's that same kind of logic that um, we're hypothesizing is happening on the seasonal scale, that it would also be a reorganization of physiology in terms of um, where are we in more pro-inflammatory states or anti-inflammatory states, um, where is our reproductive system um, sitting in terms of um, reproductive hormones and such, that um, it's not that our bodies are necessarily better off during one time of year and worse off at another time of year. It's simply a restructuring and organization um, that is very evolutionarily old because what we see in other animals is that, in other mammals specifically, like large body mammals, is that they um, essentially are allocating energy to different things at different times, depending on how it's appropriate. So like, for instance, if you're a deer and you have a long gestation period, you need to invest in finding mates in the fall and getting pregnant in the fall and having females be pregnant over the harsh harshness of winter so that they can give birth in the spring. So they're having to do that anticipation, preparation for timing everything kind of optimally throughout the year. And what that can mean is trade-offs between when do you invest in your immune system versus reproduction? When do you invest in growth um, versus surviving from infections? And so um, that's our hypothesis for how, how this is really operating at a seasonal scale. That's so interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, maybe connected to this. So, while I get that circadian rhythms are quite, you know, old and, and important for humans, for seasonal rhythms, I always wonder, given that maybe in certain places in the world, like um, the equator, there are not many seasons. So, like, you know, the argument there, I find a bit harder to follow um, how we evolve to sort of keep track of the seasons and whether that's useful for us, for us as humans. I mean, with animals, I, I, what you described, I totally get. Yeah, and, and that is a great question because humans did evolve in the tropics in terms of like our our species or we're out of the out of the tropics, but the thing is we don't know how old these clocks are. So like how deep if we do have a true seasonal circannual clock, how deep is that? Like is it only as deep as the last 300,000 years or is it way way deeper? So what would we don't really know what part of the earth it would have evolved in because we don't know the timing in which it would have evolved. But I will say that in the tropics, there is still um, quite stark seasonality, even though it's just not structured the same way as in the temperate region. So there's not the winter, spring, summer, fall um, in the tropics, but the rainy and the dry seasons are incredibly extreme. And in tropical areas is where we see, um, you know, really extreme seasonal migrations in large um, in large mammals and such. And so we know that there is um, seasonality there, which is different and it's definitely not um, light based in terms of day length. Um, that's not to say it can't be light based in terms of the color spectrum. That's still a possibility. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting thing. Biology has been very, when it comes to 
um, looking at seasonality, there's been a large bias at looking at temperate regions, but I think it's important to also think about the tropics. So let's see, there's a question. Yeah, in the exactly that the question. Oh, there is a question. Do you know what physical impairments the loss of our biological rhythms could have? So there has been some work um, looking at um, the circadian rhythm disruption, essentially like chronic um, exposure to light at night and the incidence of um, breast cancer, specifically in women, um, night, nighttime nurses in the United States. There's been a lot of work looking at that. And I think it's something like a 14% increase in breast cancer um, risk if you live in the um, highest uh, light pollution areas um, in the United States um, for these night these night workers. So we do know um, that there are some consequences to having consistent disruption in circadian rhythms, but that's still something that there are a lot of research groups um, looking at this because, there are, how do I put this? There are actual people who have, for various reasons, are unable um, to have their um, circadian clock entrained. And then there's disease manifestation that comes from that. But then there are also many of us that because of our behavior um, are chronically exposed to um, nighttime light or maybe because of our work or our lifestyle. And then trying to look at downstream implications of that it is still um, a big, a really big area of research. Let's see. So I have a question about daylight lamps, but I would say the breast cancer work is kind of the most, is the most well-developed um, daylight lamps in consideration. Okay, yeah. So um, the question was about um, the daylight lamps, or so they call them also like sad lights in the United States. Does it help um, with depression in winter? Um, and is it relevant to your study? Okay, because we use dim light. So the um, dim light in the study that we use, that simply just had to do with, we needed to keep the light conditions constant so that we can look at the underlying changes that was happening in the body. So that's, you wouldn't want to use dim light like in your day-to-day -day life. The daylight lamps or the sun lamps, which are these full spectrum lights, um, which are oftentimes, um, well, depending on what country you're in, are prescribed to individuals that are experiencing seasonal depression. And there's been a lot of work um, by chronobiologists showing that having that full spectrum light within the first hour of waking up um, can be very helpful. Um, now, when people ask me, what's what do you think is better? using a full spectrum light or going outside, I always say, well, if you have the opportunity to go outside, then that's great because you're also going to get the other co-benefits of going outside. Like if you're, if you are able to go take a walk for an hour in the morning versus sitting at a computer with your daylight lamp on, you're going to get those additional co-benefits. And so that's um, one of the things that I always like to think about is it, it should we be treating light as like um, like a pill where you need a certain dose or should we try to be going and getting that natural light because it has all, all these other benefits of going outside? Um, let's see, were there any other questions? Maybe I just have a comment it? there. This is exactly why um, we actually developed the survey because um, the idea is currently, I think in the field that we just expose ourselves very passively to light. Whereas mm. we think that it's actually a, a very psychological thing you actively engage with your environment and, and your light environment and so we want to know more about the behavior underlying this and what motivates you to choose certain things and choose others and don't do certain things and don't do others so yeah absolutely and actually with that just going that co-benefit thing I just wanted to show this um, last slide um, which is we still don't fully understand all of the um, benefits of going outside. And during the pandemic, um, it, I'm not sure how much this happened in Europe, but in the United States, there were a lot of classrooms that moved outside for the first time. And 
was unexpectedly, you know, researchers found and teachers found that children were learning a lot better outside. So um, I had pulled up, this was from um, Harvard School of Education, talking about we need to start having outdoor learning because not only are children doing a lot better in terms of just like mastery of material, but that they become more environmentally conscious um, when they're spending times outdoors. They tend to see um, for the young kids um, less behavioral issues. So they're essentially more well behaved and um, improvements when it comes to um, physical, emotional, and cognitive development. Like there was one study looking at um, if children are learning outside and then they're allowed to go and also have their playtime outside, the way that they play and interact with each other um, and develop emotionally is also improved. And so we have, there are a lot of potential benefits of going outside that we don't fully understand. And some of that is having to do with, um, with our brains, with our minds. So I think it's really important. Brilliant. I think with this, um, very positive note that we can actually change something <laughs> we can wrap up the session so i thank um everyone for attending uh, today's lecture and of course you michaela for being here it was really really nice having you and so yeah we see each other in january if you want to join again and um yeah thank you so much for being awesome. here thank you so much i appreciate it bye okay.